We have an ippy jitters. Paul has to be fast on his feet to sort out a problem muntjac. So sharp. <laughs> How do kids get into clay shooting? A couple of lads head to a clay ground how to deal with newspapers and how to take them to task and even make money from them. We have a choke demon giveaway, a chance to win a £6,000 rifle, a special offer on shooting gloves. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Gamekeepers work with nature. Sometimes it works in their favour, sometimes it messes with their minds. Here she goes. Sam! She's gone straight back behind me. This morning, Paul and his underkeeper Sam have their suspicions yep. that a muntjac has set up home in one of their pheasant pens. Top end, Sam. Yep. That's what it's clearest, isn't it? Do you think? Yeah, that's the top left corner. Yeah. So if, you, if we both go in the gate, if you work down this, this side, do a loop back up. And come back up the feed rod. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Because I think that's where it's going to be up in that top, in, in that top, bit, yeah, yeah, top left, bit. yeah, yeah. Right, let's go and have a look. Now, of course, a small deer isn't going to eat young poults, but munties and rabbits have the potential to be the woodland Uber Eats without the moped, delivering tasty morsels to the teeth outside the fence. You don't want anything in the pen at all when you are putting birds in, because basically the first night, say you put a thousand birds in here, the first night you probably get 700 of them out of a thousand that sit on the floor. Of course, you get a rabbit go through them or a muntjac go through them, bosh, all straight over top of the wire and uh, Mr Fox comes along and, and nails a load, so um, there shouldn't be any foxes in here. But we'll clear it out, push it out, and then we'll stick the fencer on and that'll stop anything else going back in there, fingers crossed. They'll do damage to the fence, I suppose. They will smash, yeah, that's what happens well, when, the, when the birds get in there, they'll go through the birds and they get spooked and they'll go and hit the fence and push the fence up and push the pegs up and of course then it, you know, wear a short sight and then you've got fox in the pen. So one of the nightmares of having pheasants and livestock. <laughs> The odds are not in our favour. High nettles, a decent sized area, and just a couple of guys walking it through could be too much yeah, yeah. or too little. Yeah, a lot of cover in here. I mean, it's a bit of a needle in a haystack, but once we, once we get it, if you get it down that, if you hear it and it goes that way, give me a shout and then we'll pincer it down the bottom end. So yeah, like I say, as soon as we get a, a movement or a sound, we'll, um, We'll try and catch it out. Paul clocks mm. Munjack Poo. Definitely one in here, there's so. definitely a squatter in here. It's a nightmare because they just live in here until you get the birds in and cause all the birds to be across all this cover and they'd come out from underneath one of these uh, branches and birds everywhere and go around in the morning with a plastic bag, pick up the dead birds outside the pen. This is our high stand. Got the aim point, got a 6.5 Krieg more. Oh, it could be in Germany, it could be in Sweden. Yes, it about the beaters, <laughs> yeah. Obviously got an array of guns to bring out, um, but obviously this is a bit of a tool for the job really. You know, you've got a bit of a heavier calibre, bigger bullets, um, they're 130, 130 grain bullets, um, which, you know, is a bit more cover, so it's overkill for a muntjac really, but it's a little bit more cover, so it'll punch through the bit of cover if we have to. Obviously it's not gonna be coming through and standing there, well I might do if we're lucky. Um, Sun there perfect, but it might be a bit of a, a moving shot. So hence the, the aim point on top, so it actually could be the perfect scenario. It's the noise from Sam. He's obviously trying to push it out, but also it's a constant reminder where he is for safety. So every, every 15 seconds you've got that rock rock. So I know exactly where he is. So I know the angles where I can shoot. 
Or he's got something stuck in his throat. I ain't sure which. <laughs> See? <laughs> Obviously not a safe shot, but that would have been an ideal scenario there. Yeah, it's that doe. It's amazing how they just cleverly go round Sam. He didn't even know she was there. That's a challenge. Go in Sam. That'd have been all right, I reckon I would have been all right. Yeah. Need about a bit of... So, young Sam, right behind us. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So. Right in front of us, sorry. No, uh, no chance for a safe one. Done quite well to move her, I think. What's that? In your point. Yeah. The back there. So, yeah. Loop in it. Clever. Clever, clever. Wow. I brought this back through to the gateway and then uh, if not we'll get a couple of the a couple of the lads. So, clever. Clever, clever. Another couple of close calls and we break and await reinforcements. Paul decides to get in a practice shot. Easy. Hit the gong. Hit the gong. Hit the gong. Good to gong. Round two, and Scott turns up with his shotgun to walk with us. Yeah, so basically she runs circles around us, and uh, we got in Scott from next door, so we'll give it a go. It's starting to get a bit frustrating. After four circuits, we start to think about giving up. Wasn't quite clear enough. Huh? Wasn't quite clear enough. <laughs> Got him. Stop. Got him? Yeah. Fair shot. <laughs> God, definitely two eyes open and just go through the motions. God, I was going somewhere. Did you get on camera at all or not? I hope so. God, that was quite. That was a difficult shot through the trees and through the stinging nettles. Can I just say who heard him? Sam shouted he was coming, <laughs> and my my main man here, the cameraman. That's good. Good shot. good shot, well done. Yeah, we put a bit of pressure on it, but um, it's actually quite funny because you said to me earlier on, how do you shoot it? One eye closed, two eyes open. And um, you can't aim at that sort of thing. Something coming through that speed, through all this cover, you've basically got to be natural with your rifle, go through, see the target, be confident, give it the lead you think or required. Pull the trigger. Yeah. Let's go have a look. Look at that for a shot there, look. It might be perfect. It might actually be pushed back on. <laughs> Did you think you missed with the first one? Um, yeah, I thought I missed with the first one, but um, well, I thought I'd just follow it up anyway. It didn't look like I did miss with the first one, actually. No, I had it smack on with the first one, I think. But obviously it's charged up. Um, charged up and uh, yeah, good blood trail. God, amazing how she took that. 6.5 Creedmoor and it's still got run on like that. You won't believe it. Hell of a blood trail through there. Yeah, here she is. 
Yeah, perfect. Let's lay this up. All clear. Now, as you can see, smack on the money. <laughs> smack on the money. How that animal ran like that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't credit it, would you? Incredible. So, yep. Very pleased with that. Good one to get. Good one to take out. Old doe. Um, yeah, good job done. And I'll be honest with you. <laughs> that aim point. Scott even said to me, and Scott's a good shot, good shotgun shot. He said, "How the hell are you going to shoot that running through this cover?" I said. I'll be right, I'll just use the old aim point and swing through. And um, yeah, I can honestly say I'm quite <laughs> chuffed with that shot because that was a difficult shot. That was a difficult shot. So yeah, smack on the money. That Job was... done. So yeah, well happy. Done. What a result. While we were waiting for Scott, Paul and David had been filming a new series for Gerber on knife applications. So when it comes to cleaning our munchak, Paul is spoiled for choice. Right, so you've seen me Gwellick with the, the bigger knives before. Um, so we will basically do it with none of these. We'll give it a go just to prove that you can do it with any knife. One of these utility knives, a little, little multi tool knife. That's quite a big blade on that one. Um, what should we do with this dinky little? Yeah, let's do it with a little little baby pen knife. Okay, little folding knife. So uh, as you can see, half the size of the, the bigger knives. Sharp enough? Yeah, let's give it a go. Have you ever had to ad lib when you're out for getting a knife or are you always carrying a <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I've forgotten, I've forgotten everything, even the rifle, David. So yeah, I have had to, uh, Mix it up a little bit. Sternum. Sternum. Okay. Give it a quick clean. A bit of green there. The front end. Okay. Back in. It was never going to be easy, but incredibly, the pen clean is carcass. a little more pheasant friendly than it was. All done with the, the baby Gerber. And having had no continental driven hunting for a while, there was a faint hint of it in Bedfordshire this afternoon. Thank you, Paul. And this is a good moment to mention our Aimpoint Driven Munjack film from 2018. And there's a link to it in the description below. Now for the man who is not so much driven as herded, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The battle over hunting tourism in the English Parliament is hotting up. While Lord Zach Goldsmith strengthens his commitment to ban trophy imports and end vital wildlife conservation projects with a series of newspaper articles slamming hunting, the committee of MPs that holds his government department to account is launching its own trophy imports consultation. The EFRA committee, chaired by Neil Parrish MP, wants the answers to questions such as Will the government's proposal on the exports and imports of hunting trophies effectively support the conservation of endangered species? Should there be different rules for the trade in animal trophies depending on the setting in which the animal was hunted? There's a link to the consultation in the description below and Charlie looks at some of those newspaper articles later in this show. The Gardener's Gun Range at Eskdale Muir in Scotland is under attack from the Eurythmics. Singer Annie Lennox is supporting a petition asking the Scottish Government to ban firearms and artillery around places of spiritual significance or religious worship. The petition is the idea of Ayrshire GP Dr Conrad Harvey, who uses the centre. It has attracted more than 10,000 online signatures and is now under consideration by the Scottish Parliament. There is now a counter petition on the Change.org website to help the Eskdale Muir Range. The headline screamed, Peterborough protest over city hunting festival. 
However, it turns out that only three people turned up to protest, one of them dressed as a fox and one of them a child. The Peterborough Telegraph says that residents are protesting against the festival of hunting, the Peterborough Hound Show, which takes place at the showground on the 21st of July 2021. Local journalist Joel Lammy does not say how few residents bothered to show up. RSPB scientists have come up with some of their most hilarious figures yet. A new report from the Bird Charity says that nature restoration could generate £6.4 billion a year. It says the money will come from recreation as well as carbon storage and air quality improvements. One of the RSPB's previous wild claims about tourism is that the sea eagles on Mull support the equivalent of 110 full-time jobs, even though there's only one eagle watching outfit on Mull and it doesn't take credit cards. The RSPB remains silent on the £2 billion that shooting contributes to the UK economy each year. A hospital in Essex has come under fire for using a hawk to scare off feral pigeons. After Southend Hospital faced criticism for trapping and killing pigeons, it hired what it calls a well-trained hawk. A group called Southend Animal Rights says members of the public have witnessed pigeons in distress after being chased off by the hawk and falconer. A correction from last week. The RSPCA released this squirrel trapped in a feeder in Cheshire. Under the 2019 Invasive Alien Species Order, release of grey squirrels is illegal. However, viewer Bob Thomas points out that under Section 14 of the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act, it is legal for the RSPCA to release the squirrel where they found it, though they're not allowed to release it elsewhere. Thank you, Bob. The new American owners of a Scottish estate plan to ban wildlife management. Christopher and Camille Bentley are believed to have paid £11 million for the 6,000-acre Kildrummy estate in Aberdeenshire. They now plan to rewild the estate, but are likely to fall foul of the Scottish Government's plan to kill off red deer in Aberdeenshire, which they will refuse to allow. With news that Spain is to ban dove hunting for a year, European hunters have come up with a campaign of information. This film from the European Hunting Federation FACE shows how 95% of turtle dove conservation is financed by hunters. It points out that the turtle dove's main problem is loss of habitat, driven by changes to farming practices and not shooting. Spain shoots 900,000 turtle doves a year. According to Antis, the annual hunt of fewer than 5,000 turtle doves on Malta is a threat to the species. One of the oldest ornaments in the world is a hunting trophy. A 51,000 year old carved fragment of bone unearthed at the mouth of the Unicorn Cave in West Hertz, Germany, may prove that Neanderthals had the capacity and skills to create works of art, scientists say. The bone believed to have belonged to a deer was discovered in 2019 and its existence revealed to the wider world this week in a paper published in Nature Ecology and Evolution. A suspected poacher killed in a shootout in the Kruger National Park was found to be wearing unusual shoes. The man was fatally wounded in a contact with guides from a private walking safari concession in the park. His shoes are thought to disguise his poaching activity. Meanwhile, in Kenya, three men caught with the carcasses of 187 dick dick antelope have been sentenced to 16 years in prison, each for poaching and ordered to pay a fine of £15,000 each. And finally, what's this? Viewer and fox shooter Rob Larkman saw it in fields in Somerset. He says he's not seen a red deer with antlers like this. Two antelopes escaped from Paynton Zoo in recent years, but they are West Caucasian tur goat antelopes with short horns, and it's more than 50 miles to the Blackdown Hills. Answer in the comments below, please. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stuck in the stories, fishing for facts. Now, I have a competition to tell you about. When Simon Cooper fell at his house last summer, little did he realise he would end up paralysed from the neck down. The British Army veteran and a former Remy armourer is having to redesign his house to cope with his disabilities. And he has a GoFundMe page. Step forward gun importer Viking Arms, which has put up a £6,000 Merkel K5 arabesque rifle as a raffle prize. 
It's £20 to enter, you can do it online or at Viking Stand at the Game Fair this year and all the details are in a link in the description below. Next, back to Paul and Crow because the pair of them have been busy shooting the jackpot clay day last week. Here's how they got on. This is Sporting Targets in Risey, Bedfordshire, and this is the Jack Pike English Open 2021. Anything could happen. Ferret, was it? Dropping ferret? Uh, lemming? Lemon. 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 That was lemon. it, yeah. <laughs> Staying on clays, what's it like to get into clay shooting? I went out with a couple of lads who are just starting out on their shooting journey. Right. Two friends from primary school, now aged 12, are on a birthday treat to learn clay shooting. They've come to Ian Coley's clay ground in the Cotswolds, where an instructor will give them an hour's tuition. Now, surely you'd expect great rivalry between them. So, Tom, are you, are you quite competitive with, uh, with Arthur? No, not really. <laughs> well, the young gentlemen, as we shall now call them, have Matt Jones as instructor today. Matt is a trap specialist in his competition life, with a string of prizes and places in the clay disciplines of Universal Trench, ABT and Olympic Trap. Today, he is teaching basic sporting technique. Well, the first thing is uh, safety, safety, safety. That's the number one priority. Getting them to hit straightforward targets. It is about hitting clays at this point in time um, and just general handling of the gun. Confidence? Confidence is definitely a factor, but I think that comes with just hitting targets and the safety. So it all plays into one another. It's very easy to get started. It's, it's harder to maintain the momentum, I think. It's very easy to get going, hit basic clays and not think about it initially. Um, but then as you go through and you start to know more and more, um, the thinking starts to play in and it's just about maintaining that confidence and realising it's not about hitting all of the clays, it's just about learning every single factor. Arthur explains one of those factors. You've got to follow through when, you're shoot when you've just started shooting. And now, because I'm left-handed, I know to close when, I, when I'm shooting a new gun. Agree with that or not as you like. One thing's for sure, Tom's mum, Nikki, is keen for the boys to learn shooting from the ground up. So Tom has got his own, uh, he's got an air rifle and I've, you know, always before, and he's been shown, you know, we've been beating and stuff and, you know, he goes out beating and enjoys it and it, I just want them to be able to, to learn how to shoot safely and he's mad on video games and shooting and, and loves doing that, but I want them to be able to shoot safely and, and you know, accurately before he... he you know, even has a go at shooting anything with a pulse. So I want him to make sure he knows how to do it properly. And, and you know, safety is such a massive thing. It's a great activity for kids to do outside. Um, and you know, I think it's really important for him to get the basics right. Well, you're a country person. He, he's a country lad. Is it a is it a kind of life skill? Absolutely. Yeah. And and again, when you're older, you know, 18, 19, 20, you know, and whatever he's going to do work-wise, it, it's great to have the opportunity, if you get invited to go shooting, to think, yeah, I know how to do that, I've got my own gun, I'd love to come. And it's a, you know, it's a great social activity as well. And just like the hunting, if you know, and learning how to run. He's not interested in getting on a horse at all, that's my thing, but he's, no, no, but really interested in picking up a gun. And, you know, being outside, it's, it's much better than being in front doing video games, why not do the real thing? At the end of the lesson, Matt says what they walk away with. What did they learn? So they learned a bit about the, uh, the timing of shooting. They can both plainly shoot. Um, bit of method more than anything. Um, swinging through targets instead of just shooting straight in front of them and hoping for the best. So a bit of technique, a bit of method on how to hit them and um, a bit of variation all over. Driven birds, crossing birds and a woodland rabbit to finish off. I'm trying to produce a good all-round shot that can choose their own path. If they did want to continue into, say, uh, Paris 2024, absolutely. If they wanted to just be a country lad who goes out and shoots some pigeons in a couple of driven days, 
perfect. Whichever path they choose, this is the way to start. Being taught properly, um, being taught the right way from the beginning, and that's the great thing about shooting. You have the option to take whichever path you want, but being taught well at the start is important. For me, I just want to just follow on doing what my dad's done and the whole generation's done. Doing game and a little bit of clays on the side. What do you reckon? I'd say I'd like to keep doing the sport that, that we both love and just keep doing it from there. Uh, and see where it takes you? Yeah. yeah. Anyone can learn to shoot. Booking a lesson is easy and the shooting ground will fit you and lend you the correct size gun and provide the safety kit. The boys are using a 28 bore and a 20 bore and there's much debate about what is the right size starter gun for a youngster. Let us know what you think and have a look at our field tester article about it. There's a link to it in the description below. We've also put a page on our website with a map of some of the UK's top clay grounds and links to their websites. Now we have an exclusive offer for you. Do you want shooting gloves that stop you burning your fingers on hot barrels? Gripswell gloves could be the ones for you. US glove brand Gripswell has produced an innovative shooting glove aimed at hot barrel shooters. Its London pattern gloves protects the barrel hand with a patented heat shield while the trigger hand glove is designed to increase grip and control. Made from goatskin leather and suede, the brown coloured gloves feature a velcro fastener and elasticated cuff. Ideal for both sim and game days, they usually cost £89.99, but you get a 12.5% discount if you use the word Gripswell at checkout. Now, what do you do when a newspaper puts out a photograph of you and says you are an evil hunter? Here's a helpful guide. It's the nightmare for anyone involved in shooting or hunting sports. Our nasty, hate-filled national media prints a photograph of you and tells its readers that you should be imprisoned or killed, or at least hated. That is what happened to Adrian Court last week when the Times newspaper ran a story about him going hunting in Africa. It, it was a bit of a shock to see your name in print and for you to be portrayed in such a way that you're coming across as the bad guy. It wasn't particularly nice to see the words written about you, especially as they were taken completely out of context and not entirely true. The questions that the Times asked me were not addressed in the article. So yes, it was, it, it, it was a shock. Adrian asked Field Sports Channel to help him with his response to the Times. We are the media experts after all. And if this is happening to you, there is some advice which I'm going to lay out in this film. The first depends on your reply to the question, do you want to talk to this newspaper or not? Adrian wanted to help the Times. We will come back to Adrian and how he did that. Another Field Sports Channel viewer who contacted us about the same article did not. Let's look at how the other viewer, Mr Unhelpful, kept his name out of the article. Mr Unhelpful has a job with a company that's big enough to have antis in its HR and PR departments. And it only takes one ante in a senior position to scare the board and panic the shareholders, which is the basis for most animal rights extremists' success with these stories. The weakness of animal rights extremists who sell their stories to newspapers is that their research is ropey at best and, most important for the newspapers, uninsured. We advised Mr Unhelpful to do two things. First, to point out to the Times that the extremists have got their facts wrong, which also has the advantage of being true. And second, to make it clear in advance that if the Times wished to use a photograph of Mr Unhelpful, it will cost £3,000 per image. A lot of money. For those two reasons, the Times didn't use Mr Unhelpful's story and didn't use his picture. Let's stop there and listen to Diggory Haydoke's story. Well, I was called by a Times journalist to, um, to give some information on the uh, charity contributions and the, the local, um, uh, local conservation fees that were paid by um, every trophy hunting uh, hunter. You know, when you go along to uh, tr uh, a safari in Tanzania, I gave him the information and explained how it worked and that was as far as it went. Uh, lo and behold, a, a picture of me with a dead buffalo appeared in the Times the following day with trophy hunting loophole being exploited by hunters or something like that. 
and a little bit of a hit piece on it. Not, not totally a hit piece, but a little bit skewed and you know, the headline was certainly negative. Uh, so I had a look at this and thought, well, they've used my picture without uh, my permission, which has happened all the time. Ever since I started on TV with Piers Morgan, they just go and pinch my pictures for the mirror or for whichever newspapers are deciding to use them. I'd always assumed that because the pictures were things that they just got hold of, that they, they could use them. Um, but um, having spoken to you, I realised that this was perhaps a little bit dodgy. Got in touch with the picture editor at the Times and um, sent him a bill for £1,200. Uh, we quibbled a little bit and we, I, I agreed at the end of it you know, to, to draw a line underneath it that I'd accept £650. Uh, and I told him that obviously if he needed to uh, use my pictures or input again, I was very happy to provide it. But uh, it would be nice if he let me know in advance and we agreed a mutually acceptable fee before I had to come and chase him after the fact. So it, it, it ended reasonably. The important thing there is the difference between use and copyright. If you ring up a newspaper and complain about them using a picture, they will tell you that it's in the public domain. What you need to do is complain about the copyright and ask for a reproduction fee. For professionals such as country sports photographer Sam Farlap, it's how they make a lot of their money. There is a really big animal activist um, group who used one last year for all their social media. They took it from the Telegraph again. All their social media, all their Facebook. That just started appearing on Facebook a little while ago. Um, so we just got loads of screenshots and we've got a, um, an agent who deals with most of that stuff. And they sent them the standard letter and eventually they did pay up. They realised they had to pay up, but that was a really good one because I actually got my agent to write to them and tell them that all the money that they were paying up was being donated to the hunt in the photograph. <laughs> there was a real, um, there was a real uh, uh, sort of karma in that one. <laughs> That's really good. Um, you where the money was going. <laughs> the agent sounds amazing. Can you can you tell me the name of the agent? There's two that we work with. One is called Pixie, P-I-X-S-Y. Um, the other one is called Copy Track. There are links to the two picture agencies Sam mentions in the description below. Or there is nothing to stop you issuing your own invoice. Best if you have contacted the offending news outlet in advance. Now, Diggory is helpful to newspapers, and you can be, because as a hunter, you have done nothing wrong. That's what Adrian felt, and he got back to the Times. So I was approached by Dominic Kennedy from the Times, an investigative journalist. He informed me that my name was going to be mentioned in a forthcoming book by an anti-hunter. He provided me with some bits and pieces to comment upon. I did so. I answered his questions honestly. I gave him the information he needed, plus more besides. And we exchanged five, six emails each time I gave him what he wanted. You were helpful. I mean, the, you know, you could have been unhelpful. You could have just... Yeah, I could have done. I could have completely ignored it. But at the end of the day, I wanted my opportunity to put my point of view across, to dispel some of the lies that were being quoted by Kennedy in the Times. And I thought it was a perfect opportunity to speak up, for, not only for myself, but for other people as well that were in the same position as me. I, I, I just hope that at some point, hunters are portrayed a little bit more favourably as conservationists. It's not all about sitting on the back of a truck, driving around Africa, shooting everything you see, leaving it wounded, whatever else the aunties like to think. It's not like that. I rang the journalist Dominic Kennedy too. Of course he has his headline already in mind, and when it comes to hunting stories, you can bet that that headline is going to be, if we were a religion or a gender, hate speech. In the end, Dominic made several factual errors supplied by the antis, such as assuming that it's unusual for animals to run after they've been shot, he's been watching too many war films, and that it's bad practice to try to dispatch wounded game. Dominic only used a couple of lines at the bottom from Adrian, staunchly defending hunting. I say all credit to Adrian for trying. How do we change the story in the long term? There is one surefire way to get a newspaper on your side, and that's to buy advertising from them. The animal rights advertisers in The Guardian mean that paper is never going to run a positive story about hunting. I did help edit The Guardian's fly fishing supplement 20 years ago, but I reckon that is the first and last time they do that. 
I applaud Basque's adverts in the Yorkshire Post. It's a good quality regional newspaper which now gives grouse shooting even coverage. In the short term, I say, if you can, be like Adrian. Tell your story with dignity and accuracy. With the media in the state it's in, it's all we can do. And if they cut up rough, why not make some money on the side, like Diggory? And there's a long version of that on our website with all the links you will need. You'll find the link to it in the description below and thanks to the Field Sports Nation for funding that piece. You'll be glad to hear it was not expensive. If you would like to join them, there's a link in the description below to that too. This week they're watching their exclusive show Field Sports Extra, which they get on Tuesday nights, and they are in with a chance to win one of four Choke Demons, the removal tool system for sticking or stuck chokes, which we recently reviewed on our Field Tester channel. And talking of Field Tester, there's a new Field Tester show out, and it's all about shooting world records. Wayne Martin attempts to break the world record for shooting a clay pigeon with a catapult. <laughs> George Digweed talks about his 130-yard clay, which we filmed 10 years ago, and how that has inspired video after video on YouTube. We also look into the latest eco clay pigeons, and we have the news from our steel versus barrels challenge. Just how good are modern barrels at coping with steel shot? Next, from the best kit and what to do with it to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. The Shooting with Anthony channel has Anthony out after pigeons over peas. It's his second day decoying over these peas. While the rest of the state of Victoria in Australia is in lockdown, McHugh CB goes fox shooting. He's out with the Maruku MK70 Max 5 camo 12 gauge and bolting them with dachshunds. In New Zealand, Archie the Working Cocker is hunting rabbits in a beautiful frost. It's filmed by My Spanels Hunting and Trialing in New Zealand. Back in the UK, Wayne Martin, who starred in our own show Field Tester last week, has his own catapult hunting channel. This is his new film about catapults and snaring rabbits and he's using a Caddyshack Evo Ergo slingshot. Also in Field Tester, George Digweed explains how his 130-yard clay 10 years ago spawned a series of videos on YouTube. Here's the latest. Ed Solomon shoots 130-yard clays on the TGS Outdoors channel. European deer stalkers are getting ready for the row rut at the end of the July. Here's a film to whet the appetite, Bock Yacht from Yacht to Tal in German, but even without German you will get the picture. Ian Jensen enjoys this film, dove shooting with a 16 ball, where they do not only load their own, they melt the lead and make make the shot plus they cook the dove afterwards. Great idea from Meat Eater. And finally, thanks to Per Homeseth for this film, Baja Sheep Hunting with Mexico Hunts by Craig Boddington Hunter. Mexico Hunts is a favourite of mine, says Craig. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, which is at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain from a rather wet Somerset. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.